It's a great pleasure to be here. I thought I'd just introduce myself slightly to, to audiences who perhaps don't know me, some of you do know me and where I come from, um, to just create a context for, for why I'm interested in thoughts and where I came from. Uh, I started off in the works of George Joby as, uh, as an undergraduate and was very fortunate then to be employed by Colin Burgess working in the North, Northern Chiviots in the late 70s, 1976. And from there went on, and something like 155 years after John Stewart first suggested it to the Society of Antiquaries that they should employ three people to go out, young men to go out and do. I was one of those three men employed in 1977 through a sleight of hand involving funds from uh, the predecessors of Historic Scotland. And from that, I found my way as a full time member of the Royal Commission for Ancient Monuments. And I've been extraordinarily fortunate in where I've gone to and what I've done in that case, starting with field systems, rigged field systems, dating from 2,000 years ago. I mean, they are extraordinary, some of these systems, um, to working in extraordinary places like Voray. And it's seen me go from that initial George Joby Iron Age, Roman Iron Age uh, background into landscape historian. So when Gary and Ian uh, asked me if I would like to be a named researcher for the Hillfort um, Atlas project, it was an opportunity to go back to my roots, if you like. Um, the Atlas is now there online. Four years of work. If I'd known how it was going to take a toll of my life, I would have never have done it. I think James would probably say the same thing. The intensity of trying to create this data source which is now available to you online. Um, you bang in any particular name into the top, East London Hill, you hit return, and there you are. It takes you straight to it. We saw one of your maps and born of this data. And the point about this, there's not just a description there for the fort if you're just visiting it there, but there's actually data lying behind this. Uh, from which you can create distribution maps of all sorts of things, extraordinary things, um, most of which will be um, uninformative probably, but nonetheless you can do it. If you can ask the question, you can do it. Now, following on from that, what am I going to do? I thought in the light of the Atlas work, just what, it, what do we mean by thought? We bandy around this uh, term, well, what does it mean? Have a look at the range of monuments in Fife and Kinross that that includes. A bit of wider context, how these forts relate to local and national settlement histories, and then what conclusions we might draw for Lo East London Hill. Um, I'm rather reluctant to draw any conclusions for East London <laughs> Hill, perhaps with a partisan audience in front of me. <laughs> One of the things you have to remember <coughs> creating an atlas, and this is the brainchild uh, ultimately of Gary, I think, is actually trying to put on the same page a whole lot of diverse monuments um, covering the entire British Isles, so not just Scottish forts. So somehow we have to get some criteria which embrace not only this sort of southern English hill fort, which is a monstrous great thing, but combine it with i put Boracle Moor up here because it's a pretty hill fort in, uh, in Isla, in the west coast. So we, we have to create criteria, and we sagely sat around with representatives from all four corners of the British Isles to come up with criteria of how we were going to define what we were going to include into the atlas. We have to do that against the background of uh, academic interest, any of you who reads about hill forts will realise that there, there is a debate which goes from uh, tactical defence, you know, military, pragmatic, to actually display that perhaps everything is about the doing, the building of the hill fort. And now even people suggest you build the damn thing, you have a picnic, and then you set fire to it, which I just find insane. I'm too old to uh, do that. And the only point I would make to you is I find it a sterile debate. Because if you go and look at the sighting of the Chevaux de Frise on Cape York, it is tactically sighted. You can't see it until you're in amongst the stones. It's not there for display. If you look at the wing walls constructed on Knock Farrell, they double the length of the monument and have no practical <coughs> use. 
But if you're down in Strathpeffer, you think that the fort on your skyline is twice the size it actually is. Display. And I prefer to talk about the architecture of power so that we don't have to commit ourselves to display or the military or, or whatever. So that's where I'm coming from in doing this. But as I say, we sat down, we came up with these criteria. Um, there's Norman's Law. I'm kind of assuming you're a Fife audience who are a walking audience who go out and visit your hill forts. Who's been on Norman's Law? Mm, not bad, but some of you've got to do better, I think. <laughs> um, <coughs> the criteria, topographic position, we, we have this hill fort, classic hill fort. Actually, that's a very English view of it, I think. We tend to just refer to them as forts in Scotland. The scale of the enclosing works, that there's, there's some pretension that they're uh, to display or defense. So thick walls, big earthworks, that's what we're talking about, multivalent things. And we put at the bottom here that with univalent enclosures, that a wall should be something like three meters, the ditch four meters, that sort of thing. And then size of interior should enclose a minimum of 0.02 hectares. Even as we did this, we realized that sites like Dunglow, it's not a problem. Who's been on Dunglow? Ooh, shrinking. <laughs> Shame on you. <laughs> fantastic site to go on. I'll, I'll not quiz you on any others. Um, uh, Dunglow, fantastic sites. Uh, there's no problem with forts like this. It's not the issue. It's got multiple ramparts, it's got a big interior. The problem comes with sites like Castle Law Abernethy. It's tiny. It's never going to make the 0 0.2 hectare grade. And yet it's fundamentally woven into the fabric of Scottish archaeology. And Ian Wilson, and my view of this, was that if you as the user go to the Atlas and can't find sites like this, where Child based his old Abernethy complex in the 1930s on Abernethy and this fantastic timber laced wall, then you'll say, hey, this is rubbish. You won't use the data source. So the solution to that was to bend the rules, two out of the three criteria. So if it meets two out of three, we include it, and you can sift your way through it as the consequences of that. Now, that, that's all very well. You solve one problem, you create another. Because every single two-bit dune in the West Coast <laughs> is built to impress. It's built on a lump which has topographic advantage, but it's tiny. Um, it's not such a problem. It just means in Scotland I have to create alternative bits to those criteria. And the simple thing here is to say, actually, um, these are buildings. These are not hill forts. These, are, these are, are buildings. And what you end up with is there's just a small number of dunes. There's about 30 odd across Scotland, which are kind of marginal on a diameter of 20 metres is the final <coughs> character taken because our largest Iron Age building is 20 metres across, up at Kilduffel, um, that that imposed across these reduces the ragged edge at the bottom of the atlas. Now, the other area which is uh, difficult and contentious is the crop marks. Uh, yes, none of us has any problems with two ramparts cutting off a promontory. But here we are, Th those are those two ramparts, the same escarpment that's being used, and suddenly you hit this enclosure, which has got a ditch which is four to five metres across. For those of you not used to reading crop marks, um, the tram lines of the tractor marks gives you a rough scale for the feature you're looking at. The dark here is formed over a big ditch. Uh, but this is, relatively speaking, tiny. But in the criteria we set up, it then starts <coughs> tipping the scales. So these are the sort of problems uh, that are lying behind doing a SIF, which I did, to cover 18,500 records, initially working out of the Canmore record as the only national record that we have. Um, yes, there are lots of uh, local HERs. Uh, to some extent, they're available online but we have a national data set. And long may it be that we maintain a relationship, a sensible relationship between national and local. It is to our huge advantage in Scotland. Now, you'll see things here as Knives to Brock, and of course the reason to look at all these uh, 
rocks and dunes, because some of them have walls across the promontory, is traditionally we say it's an outwork. But actually, it may be an earlier promontory fort, just with a rock stuck in the side. So all these things have got to be sifted through, uh, and in particular, the enclosures. Enclosure is a much used term by archaeologists. They should be kick and shot. But actually, <laughs> lazy intellectual engagement with the material they're dealing with. It's a cop-out. You describe it as an enclosure. Uh, but when you bear in mind all these sort of competing things, and we'll look at the enclosure issue in five, uh, this is the distribution that you get out. But you do have to bear in mind these criteria and how they've operated in your patch. I put up Dune Hill here, downhill Dune Hill, it must be a Dune place name. Actually, this bit in here is misleading. That's probably a, a sheepfold, 19th century sheepfold, built over the top of a much bigger fort with its ramparts round in here. I count it as Fife and Kinross, it's right on the boundary. Now, just to go back to that size issue, when you work your way through it, uh, you realise that there are almost 40% of the Scottish forts. And here, Scotland is taken to include Northumberland because the natural boundary and the distributions is down on the time. So that's almost 40% of our sites are falling below that criteria that we originally uh, set out there. So it, it gives you the idea of what the impact would have been had we adopted just three and uh, previously applied it. Um, in Fife, Craig Lusker, just above Dunfermline, South of Southern, above Craig Lusker. It's this example of a sort of uh, fort. It's one of our forts. It has three ramparts. Notable, perhaps, because Bob Hogg, who is fundamental to the hill forts, the collecting of data on hill forts and the Atlas, ultimately, he dug here in the early 1940s. I think he was probably stationed in 1940 41 uh, in Recife, and he came up and excavated on Craig Alaska, not to any great effect, I have to say. Um, so, how does this play out in Fife? Here's Dune Law up by Kettle. I've never been on this site, uh, Univallet site. There's no problem with identifying these upstanding sites, this like Dunglow, like uh, uh, Norman's Law, set on hilltops. Um, but there have been a number of casualties. Um, when you start doing these sort of sifts, you're, you're faced with all sorts of choices. And I just put up this slide, just draw your attention that because it's a fort in the national record does not mean to say that I've accepted it through the sift. There are the order of 280 Canmore records that I have omitted from our atlas. And uh, this is the map of them that I put up there. It's there one or two in, in Fife. And the point is that amongst them, there are a whole series of categories, but if you look at the work of antiquaries, it's fine when you've got Clatcher Cray, I would say that you can go and visit and look at, but of course you fall into a dead great hole there. Um, you can't visit it anymore, but we have sufficient information. There's no doubt that that was a fort. But there are a whole series of other forts that come through from 18th and 19th century records. We have no idea what they were looking at. And um, one of the, the chief offenders in Fife is the Reverend Alan Small. Uh, none of your names are Small, he's not a relative, okay? Oh boy, you only have to read his flyer where um, uh, under the site names upwards of 70 Roman forts in Fife. Um, everything was a fort. Early Bronze Age Cairn, Edmunds Cairn on Balmano Hill overlooking Glen Farr, looking down there. Uh, it, it was a fort, absolutely everything. And we've really no idea. Uh, if you read Gordon Maxwell, he describes uh, Small's account because he's trying to put Mons Graupius into the Fife landscape. It is set at, uh, on the Eden at Merlesfoot, which is somewhere just down, down there in the Howard Fife. So he's got a vested interest in, in what he's doing, and he's forgotten the intellectual engagement of Horsley and uh, Roy, and how they brought rigour to the study of Roman ports, and he produces this wonderful, as Gordon says, fabulous account uh, of, of the battle. Um, Miller, who comes in, what, seven years later, is not much better, I have to say. Um, now, 
Of the casualties, it's the one that I feel very uneasy about that has never been called up for. But it's the Danes dying, cutting off uh, the Fife Ness. It's a long earthwork, and if I was writing a <coughs> research proposal for uh, Fife, this would be top of my list of things to go and sort out, what date it is. Uh, it's there, recorded in 1684 on John and Dennis maps, so it has a long antiquarian history of record. Uh, Headland put a trench across it, but he didn't manage to date it. Uh, it appears to cut off the headland, off the nest. And of course, in Ireland, there are a number of really big promontory enclosures. Uh, the Mull of Galloway, huge big promontory enclosures. I just wonder if this is uh, early medieval or our age, big promontory enclosure. Uh, it doesn't really work as a promontory fort. The cliff line doesn't support it in that way but it's potentially a hugely significant site which we know very little about. And that's, that's the casualty I feel uneasy about. Now, of course, I'm not the first to delve through the antiquarian record. Uh, OGS Crawford often thought of as the father of aerial photography. Uh, he did his uh, Rhine lectures in 1943 to the Society of Antiquaries and picked his way through various records. You'll find about four or five, I think, in five in his uh, appendices. Uh, and to him, the solution was probably aerial photography. And he was right, I think, in one sense, uh, because aerial photography has revolutionised our understanding of the lowland landscape of Fife. Here we are looking across Milnathor to, into the site of the Battle of Mons Gropius. You can see the Reed <laughs> legions drawn up there in the distance almost. Um, in, in plumbing this with crop marks, it, it has made a huge change. Because while many of you are sort of probably familiar with the upstanding forts, I don't suppose you're familiar with many of the crop marks. Barnes uh, Mill is a little bit messy there, but there are four, four ditches or so. Um, that's out towards the East Nuke. It was on Oliver's map. Guard Bridge above the paper mill. You don't notice it. Ploughed flat. And a much bigger site in at uh, Dunnyface, just south of Kennaway. Um, big, big site, big chunky ditches. Uh, so there are a series of forts which instantly the, the aerial observer has seen them and said, fort, so those come through. Part of my problem was to sift my way through the 397 records of enclosures across Fife and Kin Ross. And they cover a multitude of sins. I thought we should look at those sins. I think if any of us were familiar with East Coast archaeology in England, we would just glance at that and say, medieval village, what's your problem? That's probably what it is. Our problem is we have a problem with villages, and village earthworks in Scotland. But again, you look out at Lucas, these enclosures, and here you have probably rectilinear floors. There are buildings up here. Fife probably has the biggest record of lowland, medieval and post-medieval archaeology in any area of Scotland surviving its crop marks, and we do nothing with it. We just call it enclosure. It's outrageous. We look at the field systems. We call it enclosures. You only have to look onto the Lock Hills and the Cleese Hills. I'm sure it's the same in the Lowland Hills. And you find these sort of field systems. These are there in the crop marks, slow down the, the hill. And so when you fight your way through 397 records of enclosures in Fife, you boil it down to about 45 enclosures of this ilk, which is the ones we're interested in, if you like. Now, none of these make the grade. Um, they're probably, I guess, our name settlements, but we have no excavations, with nothing to fall back on there. And Blackety side just tips the balance, it becomes a fort. It's got a second ditch here running, running round, so it's become multi valley it's just slipped in. But Cowstrand Burn, I think I might feel slightly guilty about that, the records of it. Ditch is only two metres across, it's in a boggy hollow, it's flat, it's wet. Um, and why I feel guilty about that is that actually I think there's a local group of lowland forts in Fife that we know nothing about. 
We have no idea what their chronology is. Um, Mount Fleury, again, not far from Dunny Face, above, uh, I suppose it's Metal or, or <coughs> uh, And then Myers Castle, which is just down the road in the, in the Howard Fife. If you know Myers Castle, this is just out in the park, out in uh, out to the southwest, I suppose. My geography is a little bit hazy in that. Um, but these are in very low lying positions with multiple ditches coming around them. And I think it gives us an explanation of Dunshelt, which is just down the road here in Castle Mill, which has always done miscellaneous earthwork. Well, I think it's a multivalent uh, Iron Age site of some description. That would be my guess. But when in the Iron Age, I have no idea. I suspect probably uh, quite late in the Iron Age. But interesting sites coming through. Now, we've collected this data, we've got this safe, what can you do with it? Um, well, you can create maps. I've just produced a series of maps that you can do. If you're interested in promontory forts, you can pull out promontory forts. One would suspect that it's no more than an expression of fortification in general. Uh, everywhere with cliffs in Scotland, where there are forts in the hinterland, there are forts on the cliffs. It's very much have a cliff, will fortify. So I don't think there's anything particularly special here. Uh, Ranston out on the uh, south of, well, I suppose it's between Fife Ness and uh, St Andrews. Uh, there's supposedly a castle site here, and I'm not sure if the castle is an antiquarian reference to the earthworks, or whether actually there's a medieval capital here. There's certainly two phases in the, uh, in the ditch system there. So there, there may be a, a castle there as well. If you like, uh, you can track the instance of ditches. We've seen Dunneface, surprise, surprise, up and down the south and east, lots of ditches, relatively few in the uh, west. Uh, if you're interested in dry stone masonry, where it is, and so often I've sat in lectures about Galloway and I've been told that, oh, dry stone masonry, this is west coast influence coming in. Is it hell? <laughs> Throughout the distribution of Scottish hill forts, there's dry stone architecture. There's dry stone masonry being used, and you now have a, fa a map that you can demonstrate that with uh, and, uh, uh, and argue the case. This up Norman's Law last Saturday, fantastic day out. See, some of you haven't been there, but I have. <laughs> um, you map types of entrances, simple gap, there's the gap just in the rampart, rampart runs like that, bang, there's not much you can say, but that is the typical entrance that we find in these things. There are more complex entrances. Here the ramparts return around the ditches, so you create a passageway going in. You can map passageways across them. I think the important thing when you think about these sort of maps is what they tell us is that there's a vocabulary and syntax to fortification, or rather to those sites we've included as forts by our criteria, which is very wide-ranging across the whole of Scotland. And that's all it means. It means they, they know about these things, and they know about it everywhere. So, once you've done those sort of maps, where, where, where do you go? Well, what interests me is the overall distribution in here because it's very clear the density that's in there and then in pockets in here compared to the density in this area and the question I, I pose to you what drives that now to some extent you look at the topographical model and there's no doubt that the gap in some bits of the map is because it's just too jolly unpleasant you know, what, why would you want to be in there? It's nasty. Uh, but I, I find this thinness in here, I think that's really interesting. And that must be telling us something about Fife and Angus of Perth. And the way we can test that is to look into a broader suite of information. We look at the instance of cultivated land and crop marks. Because crop marks only form where the sun shines, essentially. So if you have too much rainfall and too little um, uh, sunshine, you don't get crop marks. Um, the concentration of crop marks thus is in the east, East Lothian, Fife, Perth, Angus, huge densities of crop marks. And what that allows us to do is to test the fork distribution. Because if we look at the distribution of crop mark forks and what 
the contribution of crop marks is, here it is, you see that in the area of the southeast, where there are hundreds of sites anyway, there are hundreds more. If you look at the distribution in here, it's a relatively thin scatter. And yet the instance of crop marks is very similar. So what it's telling us is that uh, sites like Belordi and Angus are very unusual in their landscapes. It's telling us that the thinness of that distribution is a real feature of the past, that it's not an artifact of discovery, preservation, survival, these sort of issues. So that's, that's one interesting um, point, I think, to make here. And it takes us back, then, into the distribution of enclosures. I told you there are 45 here, enclosures of this sort. If we were on the East Lothian Plain, that would be something like 250, 300 enclosures. Actually, the numbers of enclosures is relatively low, although 45 sounds like a lot. They include uh, monuments, and those would disappear into the, into the Lothian Plain. Uh, palisades like this, there's one at uh, Angus, which clearly has houses in the interior of it, multiple palisades, multi-peering. Here's one at Rossi Drain. The uh, have five. So we have bits in common, but again, these are two pennies south of the fourth. And when you look into the Fife crop mark, the mainstay of the crop mark record, other than that broad enclosure, it's about unenclosed settlements. It's about timber roundhouses, fragments surviving without any form of enclosure. Occasionally in Fife, we get this partial enclosure, it's very like West Pleen, which Kenneth Stewart dug many years ago out, out in Stirling, but a very particular five type of site. The typical site is there's just these sort of splodges, roundhouses, scattered across the fields, and lots of them. And excavation from Murray Firth down, to, uh, down into Fife, Perth, tell us that these are going to range in date from the Middle Bronze Age through into the Late Iron Age. Um, no, no question of it. So there are other boundaries in the crop mark record because these sort of sites don't turn up in East Lothian. There are perhaps two or three in East Lothian, that's all. We're seeing underlying patterning. And I'm not going to put up graphs and argue the case in detail, but what I think we can see coming through very clearly is patterns of regional activity expressed through the hill forts and reflecting other bits of archaeological data. In particular, uh, the southeast going right way down into Northumberland and including Dumfrieshire comes out where they speak a common language. I think the whole of uh, Angus, Perth, Fife, and down into the central belt, very similar patterns, thin patterns of forts in that area. But the character of the forts then changes radically as you go up into the Merns and across the... Uh, actually, I've left Angus in, uh, in the northeast there, uh, as it happens. But the character of the forts themselves changes as you go north. So I think there are patterns embedded, and they're telling us about regional settlement histories. And the regional settlement history that, um, that Fife belongs in seems to march Kinross, Perth, and down into Stirling. Eh? That seems to hang together as a unit. Now, uh, I think we, in order to understand bits of this, it's important to look into that deep concentration. And perhaps if we can understand why there are so many in the southeast, it may give us an insight into why there are relatively few up into the northeast. This is Broxmouth. Um, this really is our most extensively excavated hill fort, completely stripped back in uh, 1977 uh, by Peter Hill, eventually published by Ian Ahmed. And it's given us a, a huge insight into the complexity of these sites with long chronologies. Um, the principal period of defences constructed here is this bit. Uh, these are radiocarbonates which have Bayesian statistics uh, applied to them, whether we should really believe them therefore, as most of the archaeological community now believe, or whether we should actually be deeply sceptical of a system of statistics which is based on a man who wanted to improve his chances of winning on the horses, I think is another matter. 
Um, that's a contentious view, perhaps. But th that's the chronology we have and seems to be uh, a, a, where many of our thoughts in the southeast <coughs> are going to be. But the important thing here is there are multiple phases of thoughts here. And when you go back into the southeast landscape, you actually find thoughts sitting side by side. You're not going to tell me these are two contemporary societies, communities, throwing stones at each other over a distance of 50 metres. This is nonsense. This is actually the disaggregation of sequences of things happening on the same site at Broxmouth. And when you go further into this, you actually find that these are those two at the bottom. It's in a landscape where there are dozens of little defensive earthworks. So what we see emerging out of this, I think, is that there are particular reasons why the southeast is so dense. Don't be misled by the radiocarbonates which are presented for standing stone. I'm not going to discuss them here. I'm going to give it as a statement that they are sadly misled in the dating of this enclosure, which is much more likely to take from the 4th and 3rd centuries BC. Um, we can discuss that if anyone's interested. Um, but I think one of the points is that in the south uh, we see the emergence of a uh, regional settlement trajectory in which everyone is living in enclosures and some of those enclosures are tipping the criteria that we set out at the beginning of the project and thus increasing the density. So we have two mechanisms. The disaggregation of comp complex sequences onto separate locations in the landscape, and then we have a long uh, history of a local settlement record which is about enclosure. And that is why that difference in the crop marks is coming through. North of the fourth, the fourth, the emphasis is on unenclosed settlement consistently, right the way from the Middle Bronze Age right up to the uh, Roman Iron Age. So how do we actually explain that distribution? How do we, how do we begin to come to terms with, with that? And what I would suggest to you probably, and I cannot sustain this with radiocarbon dates, it's impossible, uh, but just thinking about how this works is to think that perhaps there was a period of assumed normality in the Iron Age. I find it hard to believe. But if you go through late Bronze Age, Middle Bronze Age, late Bronze Age metalwork throughout Britain, it is the same, end to end of Britain. Yes, they have different uh, regional patterns, but broadly speaking, you recognise late Bronze Age material. When it all goes belly up, is in the Iron Age, and suddenly we lose contact with, with these sort of things. And what I suspect, though, is that um, actually Scottish settlement histories are moving at similar speeds to English and Welsh settlement histories. Um, and there comes a point, probably in the late Bronze Age, we see it at somewhere like, like Trapray with its late Bronze Age material of it, where certainly big enclosures, well, certainly big enclosures, certainly there are places where people are gathering and they acquire enclosure, and that these are relatively uh, early. Uh, but as then a withdrawal from that normality. I think what the Broxford dates are telling us is actually when regional settlement histories are really kicking in uh, in the third and fourth centuries. We see it expressed tapping off this big enclosure here. I hope that Gordon Noble is going to date it. Um, Jane's participated in putting a trench into the top up, up there. It's probably scarred him for life. But uh, uh, I hope they go back and actually try and date the big enclosure here, which is such an unusual enclosure, which I would bet is probably going to turn out to be early Iron Age, perhaps late Bronze Age even, with lots of platforms all across the hill. And it's the withdrawal from that and the regional settlement histories, which is then giving us this thinner scatter of sites across Perth and Fife. That's East Lomond. So, what do we say about East Lomond? Well, we're at a very unfortunate moment here because 10 years ago I'd have stood here and I could have said Broxworth dated, Clatchard Craig dated, don't know about the rest. But Davies' work 
He's been to Castle Law, Abernethy. Um, he's been to uh, King's Seats, Moncrief Hill. We've suddenly got this plethora of excavations going ahead. Here's the fantastic wall on Moncrief. You can see the timber slots for the timber-laced wall. Massive, great construction in here. And there are radiocarbon dates coming through from his projects, uh, and also from Tessa Pollo. There's Tessa digging for the surf project, Glasgow surf project. She's evaluated about 12 hill forts, I think it is. So suddenly, we've got in the order of 16 forts which have a valuation. What Tessa is struggling with currently is what, what actually the dates mean, because the one thing she can't do is date any of the hill forts as such. Um, but there is a digital resource for you to go and explore if you want. It doesn't have any dates in it, but it gives you a background to the project and all sorts of insights uh, into what they've been doing there. Um, the problem is that it'd be invidious to discuss chronologies of these sites when the sites aren't published, the dates aren't published, the contexts aren't published. <laughs> the one thing I will say is Rossi Law produced Late Bronze Age Palisades, burnt Late Bronze Age Palisades out of it, and the radiocarbon dates that between Davy and Tessa they've got will span anywhere through the Hallstatt Plateau of the radiocarbon dating calibration from 800 to 400 through into the later part of the second millennium, uh, the second half of the first millennium BC. Uh, they're very widely spread. The irony is the evaluation process was originally set out to try and identify an early medieval caput in the region. The irony being that Murray Cook sticking trenches into Barra Hill, which we see there, digging the Maiden Castle, digging another fort, consistently produced early medieval dates out of them. And note, can you identify an, a, a nuclear fort amongst them? I just put that out there for you. I can't. Um, Catch and Craig, of course, in Fife would be the other site that we could date into that early uh, medieval period. But we are struggling otherwise uh, to, to date these things and identify forms of earthworks, which you really can say, yeah, that's an early medieval one. We can, gain, we can come back to uh, that in discussion. What I think is really interesting in the chronologies and where I would guess most of the five forts, most of the big forts up on the tops of hills, my guess is that they're going to be in the earlier end. They're going to be coming through, they may be starting at 700 and coming through to 500, but they're going to be in the earlier end of the chronology that we get out of Rocksmith. What I think is really interesting is this post Hallstatt Plateau period. This period, any dates which are coming in from 400 through to through to 200, because that is becoming a very familiar theme in the dates that we're getting. If you take Dundeerdal, very much out of our um, territory, up by Fort William there, sitting on the site of an earlier enclosure, which produces an earlier date. But the dates from Dundeerdal, you can see this is vitrifaction at the top. These are casts of timbers. And there's a layering in the way the construction, the rampart works here, which is telling us something about the construction. You look at the dates, and they're kind of kicking into that 390 through to 200 period. And of course, we have a date from Craig Fadrick. It's doing the same. Dates from Dunedure that Murray Cook, they're falling in that same period. And I can't help feeling that there is one sort of fault we can identify which is probably going to be there. This is Castle Law Fog and Denny. Tessa has uh, evaluated this. Um, she can't date the inner enclosure there, but there are a series of dates which come in in that period. Um, there is also a road AD date kicking about, which I'm sure we will resolve in the, in the fullness of time. And the interesting thing about these forts is they consistently <coughs> sit on bigger, earlier enclosures. It's a consistent pattern. And I can't help feeling uh, with the, the massive wall up on Moncrief Hill, it's going to be one of these forts that Davies got there. It's not been burned, we don't have any dates out of it yet, but it's going to be another of these big, chunky sites. 
which when we look at a distribution, it looks something like this. That's Dundirdal in there. It includes Dunagoyal down in there, possibly Carradale in there. But there's a series of, of sites, Barry Hill, Green Cairn, Belvegno, uh, which Morris showed, Dunadir, Tappanoff, Berghead perhaps. Um, and then a series of, that must be Craig Fadrick, Noch Farrell, Duncanner up there. And I suspect uh, Dunlaggy, which you and Mackay dug, where he got petrifaction out of it. I think they probably fall into this, and they're in this area of thin distributions of thoughts. And every time I look at something like Barry Hill, I can't help thinking I'm looking at a castle in its landscape. We're looking at a different relationship between people living in unenclosed settlements and someone living at the top of that society than we are in the border counties, where everyone is in an enclosure, and everyone's enclosure is probably their castle. My guess, if we look back into Fife, my guess is perhaps the inner enclosure, which is really quite massively walled, but that may be another of these sites introduced onto a site which otherwise one would suspect big site, much earlier enclosure up here. And the one thing I'll say about the chronologies is that <coughs> just as in the south you get stonewall roundhouses built over derelict ramparts, in Perthshire, there's a souterrain set into the ditch there. There are two sites we can identify with, with souterrains actually built over the ramparts. But probably the majority of forts are out of business well before the Roman legions ever get here. Now, we have, of course, Thatchard, which, following on from that gap, we don't know what the Romans, and you're getting an insight into why it's so significant. Some of the material that you've been getting on East Loman is, the next site we have is in the early medieval period. East Loman Hill, or what would I say about East Loman in terms of the range of dates I would expect uh, up here. It's clearly special, isn't it? It's got a picture stone of it. We make an assumption that therefore some of the ramparts are therefore Pictish. I wonder if that is sustainable. Because when I look at this, I think I look at a prominent hill which is likely to have late Bronze Age on it. I look at a hill which I suspect is indistinguishable from an Iron Age hill fort anywhere else. I look at this very curious hill and I'm aware that yes, there are big enclosures. Here you see the rampart here which is late, it overlies deposits with Roman material in it, and we know that there were deep deposits. It's the only fault we know where there are deep stratified deposits, which we don't understand, which span the Roman Iron Age, including the late Roman Iron Age. And of course it produces this sort of stuff, that's just to keep Fraser happy at the back. <laughs> Have to put in some bling, you know. What I'm very conscious of, and this is back to the unusual character of the site you've been digging on at East Lomond, is I look at Clatchard Cray. Yes, I look at that half, it's kind of a dead ringer for what you've been digging. Um, they couldn't identify walls either, fragments of floor in here. It's probably, it's supposedly cut into a, a rampart dating from 800 AD. Um, but when I look in, in here. This is much more typical of hillfort excavations. Yes, there are deep sediments in uneven irregularities in the subsoil, but actually you take the subsoil off, you go on to outcrop. That is such a familiar theme of digging Scottish hillforts. The outcrop is just behind, below the surface. And what is so striking is when you look at the, the uh, Broxmouth sequence, most of the houses you see within the interior there, they date from the final phase. The occupation of the interior of this fort has destroyed most of the evidence of any occupation relating to the principal defensive phases. There are bits and pieces in some sided ditches, but these are erosive contexts. They don't actually lead to the accrual of sediment. There's something very different going on on your site. Yes, that, is it a fort on yonder hill? I was actually put that in in relationship to the criteria. But 
are we looking at a large implosion here? Yes, I think I see this bit of it. I'm not sure what it does. And I'm not sure what the relationship is to the top. And there is a series of questions here which ultimately we can only answer by actually excavating up on the fort itself. Because we don't really understand what the relationships are between this and what we would call a hill fort normally and any enclosure that comes off from it. Thank you.